Welcome to Ethanol Production. So again, to be clear, we're entering kind of the biofuels section. And I want to be clear that we understand about talking about biofuels. So you can have thermochemical conversion where you just combust biomass, where again goes through our traditional steam to turbine to heat or to electricity. Gasification, again, we under a low ox lower oxygen conditions than combustion, we're going to create like a syngas. And then that syngas, again, can go to electricity, paralysis, liquefaction, again, often to electricity, but we can also make some bio oil to, to higher temperature process and lower oxygen content. Those are all just, just burning in different conditions, right? And controlling those conditions to produce heat, electricity, or a little bit of bio oil. Then we have our biochemical conversions, which is what we're gonna to discuss today, which is fermentation, where again, we have distillation that goes to ethanol that is only used for a fuel. And then we have biogas, which again, biogas can be used more often, goes through an engine for electricity, but it can also be used as a natural gas fuel, which is different than biodiesel which is an extraction process. It's a chemical process. And then again, the biodiesel is just going to go through a fuel. So again, there's a lot of different bioenergy options. And the one we're gonna concentrate on today is the fermentation process, which is a biological based process. It's a distillation process that uses um, yeast to create ethanol, which then is used only as a fuel. So when we look at all of our energy production, again, biofuels, um, again, just that fuel part, so 11% being renewable, and of that 11%, 20% of that is actually the biofuels part. But then we also have the biomass waste, which again is often for digestion, for example. And then we have wood, which is often used in that direct combustion process um, for electricity or for heat. And so if we look at our renewable energy consumption, again, if we look at the yellow is our biofuels consumption. So this is something from 2000, we didn't have a lot of it and we've really grown a lot, but we've started to level off. Most of our growth was from 2005, really kicked off in 2007. And then it started to level off in 2016. Um, but we do have, again, a large biofuel consumption in terms of total energy, it's near how much energy we're producing from hydroelectric and wind. If we look specifically at our ethanol, again, we produce about what we, um, what we do. And again, as I said, we had this big explosion here and we've largely leveled off to about 3,000 um, gallon, 1,000 barrels in the US of production and consumption. And so again, looking at where this is coming from, here's our biomass of all of our energy components. Again, natural gas, petroleum being, and coal being our largest components and biomass being a small part of that, um, a little bit less than nuclear, but of that biomass, again, it's split with some going to industry with wood, for example, um, and, and just a smaller percentage, again, going towards fuel and the ethanol process for transportation. So again, looking at our resources though, our biomass resources are here in green. And so these resources are mainly here in the Corn Belt, which is where most of our ethanol is produced. But we also have a lot of other resources for cellulistic ethanol in other parts of the states and wood biomass is what we have here in the East Coast. So we have a lot of different, depending on the type of biomass, it might be corn, it might be cellulistic, it might be wood. Um, we have different resources throughout the country. If we look at the United States compared to other countries in terms of ethanol, um, again, we are the leader in ethanol production and most of our ethanol comes from corn. Um, we're followed, we have about double the production of Brazil um, where most of their ethanol comes from sugarcane. Um, and then following that with a much low, lower production level is the European Union, um, China and Canada. And if we look at kind of the um, 
production levels that we're getting. Again, we're talking about ethanol. So this is from glucose production mainly. And so when we look at corn, um, corn has about third, about 3,000 to 4,000 liters of ethanol per acre per hectare. Um, so if we average that to 3,500, that's about equivalent to 375 gallons per acre. So gallons of ethanol per acre compared to sugar cane, which has a much higher liters per hectare about 5,000 to 6,500 liters per hectare, because again, the sugar cane is much more concentrated. We get more glucose out of that. And that is equivalent to about 60, um, 630 gallons per acre of ethanol that we get. If we compare this to our biodiesel, again, biodiesel, we can also use corn for biodiesel, but it has a lot more starch and glucose than it does oil. So we only get about 18 gallons per acre compared to 375 gallons per acre if we were to produce that to ethanol, because we're going through the sugar route, not the oil route. But again, these are these values are equivalent to some of the highest values that we get for biodiesel in terms of yields per acre. Um, again, with sunflower and rice being around 100, and then the palm oil being the highest at over 600, which is very close to what our sugar cane is in terms of production of getting how many acres you need to plant your crop in to get your fuel output. So what is ethanol? So ethanol is a um, colorless liquid, it's volatile and flammable. Um, it has a lower boiling point, about 78.4 C. Um, it's fully miscible and, and soluble in water. And um, so here's our ethanol here, colorless liquid. Um, and so what we do to get ethanol, um, so how we use mainly corn-based corn ethanol is we take our glucose and we actually add yeast. And so again, it's a biological process and we get ethanol and we get CO2 that comes out of it. Now we think about, oh, that CO2 production. So we're doing greenhouse gas as well. That CO2, when you consider the whole carbon cycle, some of that CO2 that was in that glucose came into that glucose through the photosynthesis process. So originally it would have made photo, um, CO2 in. And so that equal amount of CO2 comes out during this, this distillation process that, by yeast. But again, there might be other CO2 inputs in terms of fuel use for transportation, harvesting of the corn, fertilizer that are fossil fuel based. So there might be other CO2 inputs, but in terms of the CO2 from this equation, that CO2 again has come in through photosynthesis of the corn. Um, so ethanol fermentation is actually responsible for the rising of dough. Um, so yeast in bread consume sugars in the dough and they produce ethanol and CO2 as waste products. So the CO2 actually forms bubbles and expands um, the dough, but then that ethanol evaporates in the oven. So you don't have ethanol in your bread because as that bread is, is baked and that ethanol is and that fermentation um, process occurs, um, that ethanol, because it has a low um, boiling point is gonna evaporate and it's not gonna be in the bread when you eat it. Um, ethanol fermentation is actually responsible for most production of alcohol beverages except wine. So beers, ales, and whiskeys all perform ethanol fermentation of grain starches um, that were converted to sugar. And so, for example, ethanol sugar cane is going to produce rum. Um, and normally this happens in a fermentation vessel. I don't know if you've ever made beer at home. Um, so you have a fermentation vessel that um, allows the CO to escape but prevents the oxygen from coming in, which would stop the ethanol fermentation. So again, for corn, um, corn-based ethanol, it's produced by the fermentation of sugar by enzymes produced by specific varieties of yeast. So again, those yeasts produce, produce the enzymes, which allow um, the fermentation process to occur. So glucose is the preferred form of sugar for fermentation, and it's contained in both carbohydrates and in cellulose. Um, but because carbohydrates are easier than cellulose to convert to glucose, the majority of ethanol is mainly made from corn, which has a very high um, carbohydrate content. And it's made from the corn kernels specifically. <clears throat> um, the organisms and enzymes for carbohydrate um, conversion and this glucose um, fermentation are readily available and we have corn-based ethanol throughout the country. <clears throat> 
Um, now you can also make it from cellulose. So this is again, not making it from the corn kernel, but making it from other feedstocks. And again, for cellulistic biomass, it must first be converted by sugars through a hydrolysis process, then it will be fermented. So there's an extra step. And these cellulistic feedstocks are convert, uh, composed of cellulose and hemicellulose, which are more difficult. And so a common method for converting that is acid hydrolysis. So then we have a waste product that we have to handle. So again, if we are using sugar cane, we're going to start right at that sugar process. And then we're going to go through the fermentation, again, through yeast, distillation, where we distill down and, and get that um, ethanol, drying of any water that's left over, and then we have our ethanol process. Again, in that distillation process, um, we might have some co-products that are produced, um, some leftover proteins and things that were in the feed that then we might be able to use for um, animal feed or we might be able to burn for, for um, electricity production or, or even go through biogas formation. Um, so again, if we now, if we started with, with the current kernels, then we have to convert that starch. We basically cook or do an en enzymatic hydrolysis to get those corn kernels into the glucose so that we can do the fermentation process. Now, if we start with cellulose, and when we talk about cellulose, it can be any types of plants. It can be corn stover. And we talk about stover, that's the stalk of the corn plant, not the cob. It can be switchgrass, it can be municipal solid waste, forest residue, ag residue, wood chips. It can be anything that has that cellulose in it. And so we're gonna do a pretreatment process. And again, whatever isn't pretreated and converted, we can actually use those residues for heat and power for other, other purposes. But what keeps going through that cellulosic conversion process, then we have a hydrolysis process to get to that sugar and then going through the ethanol production process. So again, if we look at a plant cell, your plant cell has your cell walls. And within those cell walls, we have the lignin, the hemicellulose and the cellulose. And so again, the cellulose and hemicellulose are the structural components that have the ability to be the cellulistic ethanol production. Lignin is not really gonna be used for bioethanol and it's really an impediment for the production. We can think of lignin as being kind of nature's glue. It sticks everything together, but it's not really gonna be able to be broken down by a biological process, whether that be biogas formation or be ethanol formation. And so it's not going to be there for um, biofuel production, but our cellulose and hemicellulose um, being five sugars and six carbon sugars um, can be used. So again, with but the carbohydrates are really what is the most available. Um, so if we're getting it here from corn, we're going to use amylase to get to our glucose and yeast to our get to our ethanol. If we're getting it from cellulose, we're going to use cellulase or more often sulfuric acid um, to get down to those five and six carbon sugars. And then we might use genetically engineered bacteria instead of yeast to then produce ethanol from those five and six carbon sugars, which is different from the glucose, which can be produced directly from yeast. So actually here at the University of Maryland, um, we actually had a, a recent retired emeritus professor, Dr. Hutchinson, who actually worked with hemicellulose and different enzymes and cellulases to actually break those five and six carbon sugars down. Um, and actually the enzymes and the bacteria that he used were actually bacteria found in the Chesapeake Bay. And so he was able to get patents on some of these processes for cellulistic conversion using genetically and using, um, actually for this, it was bacteria found naturally in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so again, if we have this biomass, we're gonna have to harvest, if we're doing cellulistic biomass, we're gonna harvest this or even corn, we're gonna harvest the corn. But here we're gonna harvest the cellulistic biomass and then it's gonna be shredded and pre-treated with heat and chemicals again to make it, um, accessible to enzymes and then they're going to break those down into sugars and then we're going to have the microbes which um, to break those down into ethanol and then it's going to be distilled and prepared for distillation. So when we think about um, corn, um, it's a high annual annual grass, mostly grown in the US and is subsidized. Um, and our output again is that 3,000 to 4,000 liters. And again, depending on um, the researcher, we may get a 10 to 20 greenhouse savings, um, 10 to 20% greenhouse gas savings depending um, versus um, gasoline. Um, versus looking at sugarcane, again, 
mainly grown, it's an annual grass grown in tropical and subtropical regions. Um, the output again is much higher. And again, so the savings is much higher because the processing of it um, is much less intensive to get from the sugar to the um, ethanol production process. So ethanol in the US was really spurred upon by um, the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. And what that act said was in 2007, it said that by 2022, that they would like to have 34, 36 billion gallons of ethanol. So that's total. 21 billion gallons of this 36 billion gallons was be, to be derived from non-graining products, okay? So that would be our cellulosic ethanol. And then 15 billion gallons, so a lower percentage, would be from grain or sorghum from these grain ethanol products. And so, and this was based on the 2007 gasoline usage so that we would be, um, that 36 billion gallons would be about 13% or sorry, 10% of our fleet. And so prior to um, 2007, you didn't see a lot of, um, gasoline um, filling stations with that 10% blend. And now almost every filling station, you have that 10% blend of ethanol, um, but that wasn't the case prior to 2007. And so what the idea with this Independent Security Act is this idea that we wanted to kind of have this corn-based ethanol be steady. We rose it up in 2007. And then once we got to that steady level, we kept it st steady. But then what we wanted to do was really rise this ethanol, the cellulosic ethanol, green biodiesel, these other alternative crops. So again, we weren't competing with our grain resources. So again, to try, this was put in place to try to, again, alleviate some of the fuel versus fuel debate. And so again, this we got this rise from 2005 to about 2006, um, 2012, where it kind of leveled off. And then we would continue to level it off with this large growth we expected to see um, starting in 2015, but we haven't seen this exponential growth that we really need. So we've had to adjust. And so again, this idea would be that our, this was our ethanol in 2007. And then our goal for the grain ethanol was have it a larger percent, 6.7%, the cellulosic ethanol being 9.4%. So our total percent would be 16% um, based on how much um, gasoline we were using in 2007. So we would be able to be at that 10% blend and even have some E85 and E15s as well. So the blend with ethanol, with um, petroleum gasoline. So um, as we can see here, if we look at the standards, what we've had to do is revise them. So in 2019, they revised the standards because again, that we weren't meeting the cellulistic goal. And so here again is where we've been. Um, so here is our biomass based um, fuels. And then here's our cellulistic biofuels that we expected. So again, a more moderate rise is expected instead of that exponential rise. And so um, what they've said is that the renew us volume set 3% higher than the mandate, which is 30% lower than the level set from this um, Energy Independence and Security Act. So we kind of realized that we're not gonna get there. So we downgraded it by about 30%. Um, and so again, we also have a cellulistic waiver to decrease the standards for that. Um, so that if it's not 100% cellulistic, but it's, it's part of it cellulistic, we can still count it as cellulistic. So when we look at cellulistic, what we're meaning is there's different things that we can grow throughout the country. So it can come from a lot of things. So again, in the Corn Belt area, we can be macanthus, switchgrass, poplars, maple, canary grass, sorghum. Um, if we look at kind of the Southeast, which actually has a lot of rain, it's a very wet environment. We can get grasses, um, sweet grass, so again, macanthus, poplar. Um, again, poplars are, it's a tree that's rapidly growing. We can do that also in the Northeast. Um, again, with macanthus and poplars. So there's a lot of different plants that could be used for the cellulistic feedstock. <clears throat> 
Now, if we look at our total production, um, most of our production um, fuel, our ethanol fuel production currently is by corn, and that is in Iowa. And so if we look at kind of our different regions, um, most of it is in kind of what we call the corn belt. So Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, Minnesota, Indiana, South Dakota, Ohio, Wisconsin, Kansas, and North Dakota. Um, we do have some ethanol production in Kansas, in Texas, and then again, Missouri, Michigan, um, Michigan and Missouri, and then the rest of the US, I'm having some ethanol production. And so if we look at our biofuel refineries, again, if we look at the number of refineries in 1980, we had a couple, ethanol was being produced back then, um, but we really see this exponential rise in the number of refineries, again, in the 2004, five, six, and then finally in 2007 is here with the in Energy and Independent Security Act, where we see this, this exponential rise in the number of refineries, and those mainly being, again, in the states with the highest production is where we see the highest number of refineries. And we do have some other refineries in a lot of the other states as well. And so what we found was that um, if we look at um, corn production, so this is corn use. So if we look at what our corn was used for, um, it was used for feed and other residuals up until again that 2007 time. And then we see a slight decrease in that. And so there was other um, things besides corn that were being used in some areas, not a huge change, but we definitely saw a little dip. And so alfalfa and other crops were being used for feed um, rather than the corn. And then we see this huge expansion for it, for the alcohol for fuel use again coming after that. But what we see is that we just end up growing more corn because we still have corn for, you know, seed and industrial uses. And so we just really increased our total output so that the amount that we have for food and feed is still there. Um, but it's just a little bit, we have offset some of that. And so if we look at our ethanol prices, Again, um, the prices have gone up and down as gasoline prices have gone up and down because we are using that 10% blend. So we do see it go up and down. Um, again, not all of our biomass, as we said, is, um, so as, as, um, is connected to um, ethanol. Again, some of it is using for electricity. And again, that mainly being where we have a lot of forest areas in the South and um, the Northeast and also the West. So again, we do have a couple of cellulistic projects going on, um, again in Iowa as well down here in Louisiana um, and Florida. Um, but again, the amounts that we're seeing is, is much lower than what was expected. Um, but we are in terms of our corn-based ethanol getting to what we call that name place capacity. And what that means is we're, we're at the capacity that we expect it to be with that 16.5. So again, almost every gas station that you go into is gonna have that 10% um, or 15% ethanol. So again, gasoline can be blended as E85, um, which can be used in all model year 2001 and newer um, vehicles from the EPA. But again, normally in, in our local stations, we still just see um, E10. Um, so that now accounts for over 90% of the gasoline market. Um, if you have a flex fuel, you can actually use E85, but again, E85 should only be used if that's a flex fuel that has a, that capacity because you are going to actually have a little bit different engine configuration um, if you're blending at that E85, the way the, um, your engine will be configured is going to be a little bit different with because it's going to be configured more towards the ethanol than for the gasoline. Um, but the energy content is less. So if we look at BTUs per gallon, again, gasoline being 115,000 BTUs per gallon, ethanol is about 67% of that. So it's only 75,000. But again, if we get E10 and we only have 10% blend, it's about 97% because um, of regular gasoline, because again, it's only 10% blend. So if we look at miles per gallon with gasoline, we would go about 35 miles per gallon. And with our E10, we can go about 
Um, so again, we have cellulistic biomass. Um, it's expected to grow, um, but again, it's, it's below our targets. And again, there are several reasons for the slow growth. Difficulty began with finances, startup time. Again, a lot of these macanthus and switchgrass, they grow for several years and we don't harvest necessarily at the first year. If you think about poplars, those are trees. So we need to invest in those, those feedstocks years before we're actually putting them into our, um, our ethanol plant. And so kind of matching that versus corn we can do on a yearly basis has been a little bit more difficult to get the industry up and going. Um, so again, we have our um, conventional biofuels and then we do have some biodiesel and then this idea that we have our cellulistic hopefully um, going up by 2020. Um, but again, as you can see, we aren't exactly there with our cellulistic. So a lot of it has actually now been met by um, natural gas, um, so renewable natural gas, which is derived from biogas at landfills. And so what, what has happened is we've, we've kind of broadened the definition of what is a cellulistic biofuel. And so since we, the idea, the vision was the cellulistic biofuels were going to be from poplars and switchgrass and be turned into ethanol, but they didn't require that because they wanted to keep it open, especially for um, the idea that you could do biodiesels and other things. And so um, if the feedstock is cellulistic and it goes into a digester, we can also get biogas from that. If you scrub out the CO2, that's renewable natural gas, and that also can qualify then um, as a cellulistic biofuel. So again, we do export some of our um, ethanol. Um, so we export mainly to Canada, um, but we use most of it again internally. And when we think about switchgrass, again, switchgrass, the idea is that you could grow it on marginal lands. We could grow it on the side of the highways. We could you know, keep our prime production for agriculture that we're going to eat and anywhere else we can grow it. Um, so again, switchgrass gone on marginal lands, we found pr produced a little bit less. But again, the idea is that we could do that, right? Um, so again, some studies have come out that showed, you know, corn's about three to 350, switchgrass, it, it really depends. And again, we have got anywhere from three to seven tons per acre. And what the study found out of Oklahoma State is it depends on how much fertilizer you're adding, what the soil type is. There's a lot of variations, just like there would be variations in corn production. And so, um, Again, we've seen some very great studies um, with switchgrass, but again, applying um, a, a lot of fertilizer. So this is something that we have to think about. We're still managing this as a crop. So we still need to apply fertilizer and have the, you know, eutrophication potentials. And we talk about life cycle assessments and, you know, fuel, you know, fertilizer that needs to be produced and all of the, those um, resources still need to go into the switchgrass um, if we're going to get very high yields or we could grow with lower yields without those types of inputs. So when we think about macanthus, so this is actually um, macanthus again and, and switchgrass. And so here's a switchgrass field, here's a macanthus field. So you can see they grow really tall. So that's why even though it's more difficult and we can't use really, we don't get as much out of it because it's not as much as a corn cob, which is really um, the corn cobs itself, the sugar is really dense. Here, it's not, it's not dense in terms of the carbohydrates, but it's just a lot of biomass. So we actually need to thorough put much more biomass than the corn cobs that we would do for corn-based ethanol to get the same amount of, um, of ethanol out of it. But what we do is just by having so much feedstock, right? Because it's so dense and it's so tall that we can cut all this down and then we have a lot more biomass. So it's more biomass to deal with than our corn cobs in those same acres. Um, and so that's why we're able to grow it at the same levels or even higher levels. Um, if we can get it dense enough, that allows us that economy of scale. But that means we have to process that much more biomass. <laughs> Um, but this should be put in perspective. So the 2020 goal for the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007 of 36 billion gallons of ethanol would be um, equivalent to increasing the whole fleet mileage of the U.S. cars by four miles per gallon from 25 to 20, 20, 25 to 29 miles per gallon. So again, all of these things like driving habits, how we drive, hybrids, electrics. Um, but again, a lot of it has to do with um, if we can just have our engines be um, more equivalent, 
in addition maybe to some of this ethanol production, um, we could really be more sustainable in terms of our gasoline use. So thank you very much. And...